This is the exciting moment before it's all going down. Welcome to our March 2020 episode of Bloodstream Live, streaming from the Bloodstream Media Studio offices in Hollywood, California. I'm your host, Patrick James Lynch, and joining me for what is a very special and unique Bloodstream Live in just a moment is Dr. Doris Kwan, the medical director at the Hemophilia Treatment Center at the Orthopedic Hospital in Los Angeles. She's here today to discuss a little topic you may have heard a thing or two about, investigational gene therapy. Sound familiar? I bet. Do you still have questions? Yeah, me too. And hopefully Dr. Kwan can answer a few of those for us today. Before we can get started, I gotta let you know that today's episode of Bloodstream Live is made possible by Biomarin a pharmaceutical company working to help patients living with rare diseases for more than 20 years. Biomarin is one of several companies investigating gene therapy in hemophilia, and it's important to share today that no gene therapies for hemophilia have been determined to be safe or effective or approved by the FDA. And today's discussion won't be discussing any of the potential treatments that are being investigated. Instead, we want to take a look at how that research is being done and what it's trying to find out. The information and materials that Dr. Kwan will be sharing today come from Biomarin's website, hemedifferently.com, where you can also find educational resources on gene therapy research. And if you'd like to follow along to some degree, I'd, inf I'd encourage you to go to hemedifferently.com right now. Dr. Kwan, in addition to being a treater of adults with hemophilia in Los Angeles, adults such as me, yes, Dr. Kwan is also my doctor. My doctor is coming in to be interviewed by me right now, so there is that. But what I was getting at is that Dr. Kwan is also a compensated speaker for Biomarin, and today's content and dialogue, as I mentioned, is based on Biomarin's Heme Differently work. It does not reflect my personal opinion or the opinion of anyone at Bloodstream Media. Lastly, we should have time to get to the questions at the end of the presentation. Bloodstream's all-star producer, Philly Gregg, is monitoring the feed, so feel free to drop in questions as you have them at any time. And if you're going to Heme Differently and poking around, you have a question about something that we're not even discussing, feel free to drop that in too. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Doris Kwan. Hi, Dr. Kwan. Hi, and thank you for that. Thanks for the introduction. Of course. Um, so, as you said, I'm Doris Kwan. I am your doctor. You are my doctor. <laughs> and I am the medical director of the Hemophilia Treatment Center, the Orthopedic Hemophilia Treatment Center that is located at the Orthopedic Institute for Children. And I have been there now for, oh, count 17 years, <laughs> oh, taking care of patients with leading disorders like yourself. Um, but before we begin today, I'd like to um, make some disclosures. This is an educational program that is being sponsored by Biomarin, and I am speaking on behalf of Biomarin. Um, the information presented today is consistent with FDA guidelines, and as part of that guideline, there might be some questions that we won't be able to answer. But this presentation is designed to discuss the science that's being investigated in ongoing clinical trials for many, from many different companies for a wide, wide range of conditions and not specifically for any particular research program. So. And we were also talking earlier about, uh, and we said already, while there's no approved gene therapy product for hemophilia, we're still in the research phase, there are gene therapy products out in the world for other conditions. And I know we're going to get to that later, but yes. that's pretty exciting, isn't it? It is. Lots of stuff going on. So for starters, I thought um, that I could ask you some of the questions that I know I and others in the community have about investigational gene therapy. As you know, there's a lot of buzz about it. Lots of buzz and lots of good reason for that because, again, there's lots of stuff going on, not just in hemophilia, but gene therapy in general right. and lots of uh, different gene therapy trials, including hemophilia. Um, there are many companies undertaking gene therapy research. FDA does place some restrictions on what we can discuss. There are lots of questions I can answer, but because no gene therapies have been approved for hemophilia A or B, um, we are just answering just general science questions and basic research behind the hemophilia. Some of the questions that we won't be able to go through today are, you know, will gene therapy be approved? I can't answer that. You're we, not we, we, the FDA's ultimate authority on no, that? No, we're ah. looking, all the trials are looking are safety and is it effective and that can only be answered after the trial is done and run. And that's run and done. Yes. Run and done, that works. Yeah. And that's ultimately by the FDA as far as yes. the US goes anyway? Right, and okay. then there are gene therapies, does it, does it work? 
what is it safe? Well, that's what they're trying to do, right? Determine that. Right. And will the gene therapy work for me? Ugh, I can't answer <laughs> that, right? I don't know. And I think big question in a lot of people's mind is how much will it cost? Yeah. Can't answer that. Okay. It's not here. Well, so. now I know often we say, you know, talk to your doctor before making any decisions about your care. And you are my doctor, so can you answer questions about whether or not gene therapy would be right for me? Nah, I can't answer that right now. I'm not your doctor right now. I'm being interviewed by you. Oh, well played. <laughs> Very well played. All right, so fair enough. There are some limitations. As I said earlier, if you go to hemedifferently.com and sign up for the email list there, as more data and information is available, it will be delivered to you. But that's enough on what we can't talk about. Let's yes. get into some of the plenty of stuff that we can. We can, yes. Um, so starting with the basics, could you walk us through some of uh, the 101? What is a gene and what is the relevance to gene therapy? Your eyes just did a thing as though you didn't know the question about what is a gene is coming. No, I'm just like, oh, back to basic biology. Ah. I see. I'm sorry to put you in that headspace, but if you could help us out, <laughs> oh, what's a but gene? Biology is what I was good at. So we're OK with that. Good, because it um, wasn't so, my strength. What is a gene? A gene, very technically, is a segment or piece of DNA that, can, that codes for a protein. And what I mean by that is this code is a blueprint. So one gene encodes for one protein. So that gene gives instructions on how to make that protein. Makes sense. And the proteins are like the building blocks. Hmm. Um, they actually do all the work. So your proteins do work. And it'll do take care of things like they're the building blocks in your body that help you do things, repair tissue. Mm -hmm. And in your case, it might uh, help you clot your blood. That's a good thing. The factor eight and yes, the factor nine protein, exactly. for example. And okay. so they're also responsible for things like your eye color, your hair color, the size of your feet. Hmm. And to be specific and coming back to hemophilia, for example, mm -hmm. you have a factor eight gene. That codes for your factor eight protein. And in hemophilia B, you have a factor nine gene, and that codes for your factor nine protein. So that's protein. interesting. So because it's one gene, one protein, is that why hemophilia and cystic fibrosis and certain conditions or disease states are the ones being researched yes. currently for gene therapy? Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes. So we call that monogenetic so monogenetic yes yeah, so okay. it's a monogenic monogenic so, yes Aha. so there's one gene for one protein okay and that is easier to target for example conditions like schizophrenia may have multiple etiologies or causes and not just mm. one thing that causes it and that would be harder for us to fix right away whereas if you target this is the one gene that causes the one disease or condition. That makes a lot of and sense. And so the hemophilia A or B, if you have hemophilia A, your factor eight gene doesn't work right. Right. Or if hemophilia B, your factor nine gene. So we can just target either that factor eight or factor nine gene. You know, I've never actually thought about this. It would be, <laughs> I could brag a whole lot about my factor nine gene. My factor nine gene and my factor nine protein production as best I know. It's fantastic. But we're always talking about my factor eight production or the lack thereof. I really need to talk more about factor nine because I'm very proud of my factor nine <laughs> yes, production as it stands today. <laughs> um, so appreciate that background. So with that in mind, knowing a bit more about genes, how they lead ultimately to proteins in the body, um, and why certain genetic conditions are being researched and investigated in the forefront of gene therapy. So how does all of that fit into today's discussion about investigational gene therapy? So gene therapy is being researched to see if it's safe and effective and it can treat uh, and it can be used to treat different disorders, different right. disease states. Um, you know, gene therapy has um, been talked about for lots of years, like 50 years. Which is a long time. We think of it as being something that's very new or science fiction-y, but in 2020, there is a gene therapy treatment approved, not for hemophilia, but yes. for another disease state. So it's not something in the future. It's no, here. It and is it's here. got quite a history. Yes. So people started being able to manipulate uh, DNA in the laboratory in the 1970s. And that's exactly when the first gene therapies were being talked about. Mm. So 1972 or so, and they were able to, you know, find the factor eight gene and factor nine genes in the 80s. And so that actually made 
possible gene therapy for factor eight hemophilia A, factor nine hemophilia B, because you mm. need that gene in order to try to pair it. Of course. When so, did you, I know I'm going off script here for a moment, but you mentioned earlier 17 years that you've been at LA, uh, at the orthopedic hospital. When did you first start hearing about research into gene therapy for hemophilia or research into gene therapy for any condition? So it was really interesting. Actually, I was in college. It was the mid 80s. And I started working in a laboratory that um, worked on a genetic condition. And when I talked to my mentor, I said to her, oh, I'd be really interested in having gene therapy uh, work. And she said, yes, gene therapy will work during your lifetime. We will have it. Wow, she was and, really and optimistic. So she, yes, she was very optimistic. So that was the first time I was like, oh, this could be an area that I could go into. Hmm. Wow. So those were the roots back when I was in college. And I think it's important to just put that context on something that I know for me as a person living with hemophilia, when I first heard about gene therapy connected with hemophilia, it felt like the future. It felt like science fiction. But this context of how the science and the research of gene therapy has been going on for quite some time, suddenly the investigational clinical trials of today don't seem so, I don't know, science fiction-y to me. But anyway, I did not mean to derail you. I know that no. I know you were starting to get into there's 50 years and currently many, many, many ongoing clinical trials. How, do we know how many clinical trials in so gene therapy right now? So there are lots now? of clinical trials going on in gene therapy. Uh, like I said, thoughts started in the 70s, moving to the 80s, and the first gene therapy actually in hemophilia was in the early 2000s for hemophilia B. Then actually what really took off was in 2011, the first uh, articles were published about hemophilia B gene therapy, and then moving on to hemophilia A. And so there are currently lots of different gene therapies going on, actually more than 2,000 I just different, get it. different gene therapy trials. Which is incredible. Many, many of, yeah, many, many of them are what we call preclinical, meaning they're in animal models. Okay. Um, and they're doing research. And we're back. You know, we're Dr. Back. Kwan, before all this, I went to theater school. And one of the things that I learned to love about theater school was the possibilities of the moment. All the plans in the world can't compete with the possibilities of the moment. So we had a little crash because we just have so many people who want to know about investigational gene therapy. And, uh, and now we're back. So I think people may have lost us at different times. I'm going to do my best to take us back to where I think people generally lost us. And if you have questions, a reminder, you can throw them into the comments of the video stream and we will get to them at the end and we will get to them at the end. Um, so Dr. Kwan, Yes. We were talking about the relationship between genes, proteins, and then vectors. So if you could walk us through some of the basics, what is a gene? What's its relevance to gene therapy? How do those pieces work so in tandem? Just, just to recap, so we talked about what a gene is, which is a piece of DNA. And that piece of DNA actually what I call codes for a protein, meaning it gives the instructions on how to make it. So I guess it's the top guy, right? It sounds like it. It gives the instructions on how to make this protein, and the protein is the actual worker okay. that actually does the work. So the example would be your factor eight actually helps your blood clot. That's true. I'm just yes. thinking in my in my work life, I think that would make me the DNA and everyone who actually gets things done around here, the proteins. Yes. So I'm going to start referring to my employees as proteins. That sounds way more fun. <laughs> So the proteins, I always say the proteins do the work. And so... I would agree. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's kind of how I look at it. But proteins um, are the building blocks, right? They, okay. They make your eye color, they make your hair color, things like that. So they're kind of responsible um, for yes, everything. They, they will they re repair your tissue, as I said. And so those are really important. And the... the uh, Factor eight gene codes for the factor eight protein. The factor Makes nine sense. gene codes for the factor nine protein. Just some basic information. And so when the factor eight doesn't work or the factor nine gene doesn't work or isn't working properly or you don't make enough of it, you will end up with either hemophilia A or B. Got it. Okay. So in, in, once we actually have that gene... How do we, well, we should go, we should touch on there are different forms of, quote, gene therapy, right? Yes. So we hear the term gene therapy a lot, but in actuality, that's an umbrella term that's catching a few different 
things that are being researched currently, yes. right? So can yes. you break that down for us? So there's a couple of different types of gene therapies, which I had reviewed before <laughs> we had a little crash. Um, so one type is gene editing, and the buzzword is CRISPR. Yes. Uh, and that is exactly one type of gene editing. And that's a technique where or a process where you will actually repair or replace the working gene with your own gene that's not working properly. Okay. And so you're actually going into the DNA and repairing it. And some people use the word cut and paste. So you hmm. might cut out the one that's not working and put in, paste in, so to speak, the one that is working. Cut and paste. Okay. Yes. So some people use that terminology, but it's gene editing. It's like editing the paper. Um, Makes sense. And then the second type is cell therapy. Um, the popular one that has been approved is CAR T, and that's where you take your. Cells. And that was approved for hemophilia. No, 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 for cancer. Oh, some cancers, cancer. not all cancer. Got it. But some of the cancers uh, have CAR T approved for that, and what that is that you take out the cells from your body, and you replace it with the working gene, for example, and then you take those cells and then put them back in your body. Okay. That's the second type. CAR and T. the third type, which is what we're going to be focused more on today when we talk about the scientific process for hemophilia gene therapy, mm -hmm. the scientific process, and for other gene therapies, um, what you're doing is transferring the gene into your body. So you're putting that working copy or working gene back into your body. So the, so if I'm understanding correctly, the gene therapy research being done for hemophilia and other disease states is primarily in this gene transfer realm, not the CAR T or the gene editing. It's yes, primarily gene correct. transfer. So in uh, for specifically for hemophilia, much of the research is going into gene transfer. I see. Okay. So making and transferring a functional gene, that sounds like science fiction. So how does that happen? a lot of work. I would imagine. Lots of research has gone into it. Um, the first thing we talked about is making making uh, a functional gene. Um, and we had sequence or we had found the factor eight and factor nine genes many years ago. And what we're doing in the laboratory is creating the optimal functional gene. Okay. For either factor eight or factor nine. So you can design that in the laboratory. So that's completely done in a laboratory. It right. doesn't come from a person, doesn't come from anyone, a lab. No, it comes in, it, it's done in the laboratory. So that's the first step. Hmm. The next step, and we didn't talk about this, but you can't just introduce DNA into your body because the DNA is fragile and your body will break it down. Oh, sure, yeah. So we need to protect it. Okay. And so what we do, one way is, uh, what we do is to develop a way to protect it, and then we need to guide that functional gene to the right part of the body. Sure. So in patients with hemophilia, we're trying to get it to the liver. Right. And Why part the of liver? That, well, part of that, I was just going to say. Oh, I'm sorry. You're, that's okay. You're the expert here. I'll let you no. talk. <laughs> no. The reason is that the clotting factors are made in the liver, so we think that moving a uh, factor eight or factor nine gene into the liver, those cells will be happy to make it because they already do it. Right. Wouldn't be very helpful if it was sent to the big toe or no. to the left elbow. No. And I so see. we can actually try to target these. Uh, and there are certain things that we can pick to target that. So that the, that's the second step is to develop a way to protect that DNA and then to guide it to where we want it to go. And we can talk about that later because that's part of that vector. Okay. And then, um, then we wanted to deliver that gene into the body. So we have to find a way to do that. And the most important thing, of course, is whether the, the body experiences any side effects or their safety concerns and whether the body can actually read the instructions on the working genes and to make the proteins that you're interested in. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And that safety and efficacy uh, monitoring, that would also include uh, the response that, say, that target organ, we used the example of hemophilia in the liver, yes. how that organ is responding, are the actual proteins being created? Exactly. Is all of that part of that kind of safety yes. and efficacy monitoring? Yes, that's, that's the hard part. I mean, we did all this background. The scientists have made the gene, and they 
um, packaged, we call it packaged. Okay. Um, you know, we have to protect that DNA and get it into your body. Then it has to go to where we're targeting. It's a lot of work, right? But that's <laughs> all been done. And then once it gets into the body, we that the most important thing that we have to do is then to follow the patients very carefully and make sure that nothing is going, you know, nothing unusual is going on or sure. unexpected. Sure. So that protection piece has come up a few times. We need to protect this piece of DNA as it's making its way into the body. So what are we using to protect it? It's designed in a lab. How does it get into the body? So we're using this thing called a neutralized antibody a or neutralized. sorry virus neutralized virus okay that sounds the word virus can be a little scary the it's word really neutralized scary. is <laughs> it is really scary <laughs> i'm glad you said it though the word neutralized however takes some of the sting out so what exact what's a neutralized virus mean so a neutralized virus is one without genetic material inside but i don't want to say that we're taking a virus and taking out its you know, DNA, what we're actually doing is we have the technology now to actually make that virus, but we're only making, we're not actually making the virus, we're making the virus shell. Okay. It's so kind of like a transport vehicle, you might say. So in other words, if I really wanted a turtle shell, but I wasn't <laughs> interested in a turtle, right? I might just that design a turtle slow shell. to get into the cell, right? Yeah, we're not going to use it for the purposes of investigational gene <laughs> therapy. But in other words, you're only creating the piece of that neutralized virus that we care about. In this case, the shell to protect the DNA. Yes. The contents that would otherwise be in that virus, we never even see those as part of this no. process. Is that right? No, correct. So in the laboratory, um, we create that shell that we call the viral shell. It's specifically called a capsid. That's a technical term. A capsid. I, right. wanna, I like the technical terms. It makes me sound smart. I'm going to write down capsid. <laughs> so we create that inside the laboratory, and then we put the DNA that we're interested in or you're interested in is the factor eight, factor nine, and we put that inside that viral shell, that neutralized virus is what we call that. And once we put that DNA inside, we call that a therapeutic vector. Got it. I've also heard the term viral vector. Are those essentially the same thing? Yes, because it comes from a virus and it's derived from a virus. It's not the actual virus itself. It's not like we're taking virus, growing up virus, and then taking out its DNA. Right. No, 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 no. We're Which not Which was what that. I originally no, thought, to be honest. No, what we're doing is that we're making and creating it in the laboratory, just the shell, no virus DNA is in it. We're putting in our virus, or sorry, our um, DNA of interest. Mm -hmm. And I try to describe it akin to say, uh, for example, you're trying to ship something fragile. Let's say your mother's birthday is coming up and you want to ship her a very pretty glass vase. That well, would you... have been a good idea. <laughs> but, you know, you can't just put the glass vase into the mail, that right? That would not be a That's good idea. That, right. So you package it because it's fragile. Hmm. You package it inside a, a box. A turtle shell. Oh, a box. A, a box. Thank you. <laughs> Hard to get a turtle shell. I'm just really stuck on that metaphor now. Yes. So you package it, you put it in a box, right? And so, and that can be delivered to where you want it to go in hopefully in this case, your mother. But um, what we do with the DNA, we want the DNA to be protected to get to where it wants to be or needs to be. Mm -hmm. We put that DNA inside that virus shell, and we call that the therapeutic vector, and that vector will be placed inside your body. And so that, that's the next step, of course, after we create the virus is to put it in the body. And that's usually done by a infusion, IV infusion. Like I take currently? <clears throat> sort of. So you take your uh, factor currently se several times a week. Um, this would be a one-time infusion. Okay. Or and that's the hope anyway, right? Yes. That's so the hope. we want to do a one-time infusion and to try to get this uh, virus with the DNA inside your body. Got it. Okay. So the viral vector comes into my body through uh, an IV. Hopefully it's only once. That's yes. what the research is looking into. It's certainly not several times a week as no, like you said, just I'm the one time. currently doing. Um, so what happens? Uh, oh, let me before we actually get to that. Um, how does somebody know if they 
might be a good candidate for uh, an investigational clinical trial. How do people, when they're researching this, I guess yes. the question I'm trying to ask is, um, are they researching it in everyone or is it more narrow than that? So we can, when we run a clinical trial, we try to include everyone, right? But may, But we have criteria and unfortunately, not everybody may be what we call eligible. And what I mean by that is that um, the virus we're using is called an adeno-associated virus. Is it the AAV? The AAV. Okay. And people sometimes mistake it for adenovirus, which is not the same thing. There's only one A in that one. That, yes, correct. So the AAV, or adeno-associated virus, we call it non-pathogenic. Non-pathogenic. And, and it doesn't cause a bad disease or anything like that. And so what ends up happening is that people may have been exposed to it and they will develop antibodies and develop what we call an immunity to it. And so with that, if we give them the AAV with your functional gene, it may not work for them. So before hmm. we even allow them to, to get this, we do what we call a screening process to see if they have antibodies against that virus. Huh. So even if I'm someone who is interested in participating in a clinical trial, I do all my homework, I'm, I'm on board for what it's going to mean on the other side, I'm, I'm down to not drink for a year, I'm going to oh, come yes. to my clinic That's all the time, I know thing. we're going to get into yeah. all that. But even after all that, I could show up and be screened to learn that, hey, when you were four, who knows, you developed an immunity to something at the yes. playground you unfortunately are not unfortunately, qualified for yes. this. It's kind of like if you've had chicken pox, you've been exposed to it, you can't get chicken pox again. So huh. you built an immunity. And so same thing, if you've been exposed to this virus, the adeno-associated, you make antibodies and we can actually test in the laboratory it, the presence of those antibodies. It must be really disappointing for people who get screened it, out. It has been, yes, for some patients who wanted to participate. Mm. So that's a good thing for everyone to just be mindful of that yes. there are, I'll say, nuances to what you know investigational gene therapy is learning that are very different from currently available therapies for hemophilia, very yes. different processes for mm -hmm. us to be sensitive to. And just to remember that because we're working with AAV and we're trying to figure out what the neutralized virus to use, the basic science behind that is that, you know, they're trying to, the, um, the, we have to pick a certain type of virus. And so the size of the, um, how much DNA it can hold, that's a very important thing. So hmm. The, the potential to contain and transport the working gene. So in this case, size matters. The size of the virus shell matters. That makes sense. And the, um, the potential to go to certain places. So the AV virus likes to go to the liver or can go to the liver. We call that a trophism. A trophism? Trophism, yes. And Which... so they, like, they can go and they like to go to the liver. Um, you know, for example, you want it to go to the liver because it's a clotting factor, but the, there was a gene therapy that was approved a few years ago, uh, the one for the eye blindness, the retinodystrophy. Oh, nice job. You don't want that to go to the liver. You want that to be in the eye. Right. Because we, that, that causes a blindness. And so um, the gene therapy allows the patients to have vision. So we want the eye to be the target in that particular in that case. case. Yes. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm going to use this as a quick <clears throat> reminder that if I'm asking my questions in real time, if you have questions as you're listening to Dr. Kwan, do leave them in the comments of the live stream and Philly Greg will organize those and we'll get to them at the end. Please continue. So, oh, no, I'm Oh, okay, ready, ready for, for the my next question? question. So, I want to make sure I I'm I'm uh, capturing this correctly. Essentially, we have a working gene we add it to an empty shell box, turtle shell, you're yes. sending your mama vase, whatever yeah. you want to use there, shell protection. And that equals the therapeutic vector. The therapeutic yes. vector mm -hmm. through an IV goes into the body. And thereafter, it's the individual is monitored for the safety and efficacy of this investigational gene therapy treatment. Is that yes. kind of where we're at? Yes. Okay. That's where we're at. So um, you may have already addressed this, but why is it that the liver is particularly important in the case of hemophilia A or B? Um, it's because liver makes lots of proteins, and some of the proteins that it makes is actually the clotting factors. And so we think that, well, you already do it. 
So let's have you do a little more. That makes to your point from earlier. That's why we don't send it to the eye or to the elbow or somewhere else. So that's one of the reasons. Yeah. Okay. Because factor proteins are made in the liver. Makes sense. So uh, once the therapeutic vector has entered the body, uh, we just said, and broadly speaking, the individual will then be monitored for the safety and efficacy over time. But specifically, what are the researchers looking for? Lots of things. So um, the studies are looking to see if the copies of the functional gene can be delivered into the target cell, right? So we want to make sure that they're getting there. We also want to make sure that any of the side effects and the risks and to see if the body has started making the protein. So we get it there. We want to make sure that it's actually making it so that the gene and the protein are being uh, the protein from the gene is being produced. That makes sense. Um, it's uh, important to note that the gene transfer, the most common method for hemophilia uh, that we're using, um, that the principle was being investigated is the bot. Oh, just wanted to make an important point mm. that it's not gene editing where your, your, um, your DNA is actually not being changed, right? And so your gene can actually, your hemophilia gene can still be passed on because we're not changing your own. Right. We're transferring a functional right. gene to essentially offset the dysfunctional right. one, but that dysfunctional one is still what's part of my DNA. Right. right. So lots of things that we're looking at. And again, it's safety that you're making the protein that you're supposed to be making. And so those are the, some of the things that we're looking at as part of the clinical trial. Okay. So, so it sounds like the clinical trials are evaluating the effects of what happens when the investigational therapeutic vector is transported into the body. So what are some of the questions that the clinical trials are, are kind of using to guide how they are monitoring the safety and efficacy over time? Uh, short-term and long-term side effects. So when you get the uh, gene therapy, it's a single infusion. We're monitoring during that infusion your blood pressure, your heart rate, making sure you're not having any, you know, things that are unexpected. And then long term, right? What happens long term? What's going on? Um, is your body producing what we're asking it to produce, like the factor eight or the factor nine? Um, how about too little protein, too much? We need to make sure that, you know, you have enough or not too much. So we're monitoring the levels of the protein. Makes sense. Um, and I think what's really important as being a doctor is, mm. is your quality of life. You know, what are the benefits of this? Um, and how, how are you managing your condition after the gene therapy, right? So we're giving you the gene therapy in the hopes to improve uh, the condition. Mm. And so is your quality of life being affected? So we ask those questions when you come in for a visit. And how long will these effects last? Th those sorts of things is what we're really interested in. So quality of life you brought up as a doctor is something that's paramount to you. And I want to forget for a moment that we're talking about research into gene therapy and investigational clinical trials, forgetting about all of that for a moment. How do you go about working with your patients to determine how, their quality of life and then have that information at your disposal to help them consider what options may be best for them. Again, not thinking specifically about what we're talking about today. I'm just curious to know, as a hematologist, how do you figure out quality of life? There's lots of different ways. One, I actually talked to you about it. Ah, <laughs> Imagine that. A conversation with your patient. And I have to say, actually, you do a great job of that. We spend Thank a lot you. of time in the clinic just kind of talking through things. And that helps me as a patient always feel more secure right. and as though I'm, okay, I'm in the right place, I'm getting the right information. Right, so um, outside of that, the conversations that we have, the way that they can do it in a clinical trial is actually what we call uh, quality of life questionnaires and we actually will have the patient and I leave the room because I don't wanna influence mm. your answers at all. Um, and so you answer these <clears throat> sort of anonymously with nobody really looking at the answers while you're in clinic. Okay. And they get sent over to somebody to analyze. So the quality of life questionnaires are really important for people to answer. Even though there may be a lot of them, it's important information that we need in order to run these clinical trials effectively. Because but ultimately, what's the goal is to treat the patient and improve their quality of life. Exactly. Yeah, no, that makes perfect. Thank you for walking through that. Mm -hmm. All right, so getting back to our track, um, 
you mentioned we talked about what the researchers are looking for following that IV of your therapeutic vector. But from the patient perspective, what happens after a gene therapy infusion in clinical trials? What Ooh, takes place? Oh, that's when the fun begins, right? Oh, that's when the fun that's begins. That's when you get to see me more often. Then that is when right. the fun begins. <laughs> I don't think so, but... But I answered anyway, that pretty well, yes, though, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so after the infusion, you actually are... Mo- the infusion doesn't take very long, just to reassure people. Hmm. Um, it, it, you go to the uh, site where you get the infusion and the infusion takes one or two, depends on the patient, one or two hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, Monitor them because, you know, with any drug, you can get an allergic reaction. So we want to make sure that that's not happening, right? We need to make sure it's safe. Sure. So that's the first thing. We monitor heart rate. We monitor blood pressure, as I said. And then we, um, after a number of hours to make sure you're stable, we let you go home. Yes, you do go home after this. All right. That's a good. Yes. That's good. That's encouraging. And then we um, have you come back into clinic. And in some of the clinical trials, it could be weekly visits for a number of months. Hmm. Uh, it, it depends on every, like I said, this is not a specific clinical trial we're talking about. Right, right. There are many clinical trials going on. Uh, different companies, different gene vectors, et cetera. But you make an important point. You could have there. to go to the clinic weekly thereafter. Yes. There might be a lot of in-person touch points to be aware of. Yes. And so because this gene therapy um, targets the liver, we are going to be measuring blood work that affects the, you know, the, the blood work and check to see how your liver is doing, check to see how your kidneys are doing, all those sorts of things as part of the clinical trial. We might measure the amounts of protein, the the protein of interest, hemophilia A or B, factor eight or nine. Mm. Um, The other thing is because it's a very complicated uh, process, we know there are many things that can affect the liver. And so, oh, don't. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Tell me more. I'm I'm on the edge of my seat. Yeah. Kind of literally. Things that might affect the liver, alcohol, right? And we may ask you to refrain from drinking alcohol for a period of time Mm. because it, again, may affect the liver, which might affect the protein that's being made. So you mean to tell me if I want to participate in an investigational clinical trial that I have to abide by a certain protocol that may impact me for years yes, to come? Possibly. The other thing that is important in some of the clinical trials is that you may be asked about reproduction and use of Ooh, here to say that barrier contraception. Well, that's okay. We're we're all adults here, but what? But why? What's important well, about that? Well, there's this thing that we call vector shedding. That's uh, the body trying to eliminate the the uh, vector, the virus vector, the shell, is that? The, yeah, the okay. shell as well as the DNA, and okay. we're trying to understand how it's being eliminated, and so we will measure in your bodily fluids. Um, this shedding of the vector, and we will be collecting things like blood, uh, urine, semen, um, saliva, mm. and this we're measuring how much, if any, virus is being shed into it. So I know with the coronavirus being top of mind for, I don't know, every human being who doesn't live under a rock, um, <laughs> there is uh, discussion about operating out of an abundance of caution. So would it be safe to say Things like don't drink for a year after, and again, we're being kind of generic yes. here, but generically speaking, don't drink for a year, contraception, we're going to get involved in your plans for that. Yeah. All of that is fair to say out of an abundance of caution. There's not necessarily yes. something specific we know about. No, but there is ab- nothing specific that we know about it, but we're trying to be as safe as possible. So we're taking extra steps to be cautious. So that's important, I think, for on, as a patient to just be mindful of what does it mean to participate in a clinical trial. It's not just the infusion on the one day that's a couple hours and then you're monitored. There are a lot of different things to be aware of, neither good nor bad, just important to be aware of. And as you've mentioned on multiple occasions, what there's uh, over 2,500 clinical trials and gene therapy going on all around the Mm -hmm. world. They all have different protocols and ins and outs. Yes. But it's very important if you're considering one for yourself to know what you're getting yourself into. And I'll mention for our community in the hemophilia bleeding disorders world, NHF, HFA, and Lori Kelly have all put out great material on the questions that you should be asking yourself, the questions that you should be asking your doctor, 
in the clinic, not if they come to your studio for a podcast yes. interview, then they won't answer those questions. They'll say, come <laughs> to the clinic. I need the copay. But <laughs> yes. there are a lot of things to just be mindful of before getting involved is the point Absolute. I'm trying to make, right? Absolutely. Yes. And we go through, again, as I said, this very detailed screening process to make sure that you're actually part of it is your safety, that you're okay for it. We have to check your liver functions, your kidney functions, and make sure that you are a good candidate of to course. make it safe. Um, so reminder, all of this is based on the Heme Differently work that Biomarin has done, which you can take a look at yourself at hemedifferently.com. Another reminder, if you want more information as it becomes available about the research into gene therapy and the investigational trials, uh, be sure to sign up for the email list. And as more information is available, you'll get it directly into your inbox. And if you do have any questions, a reminder to put those right into the comments of this live stream. And we will get to those actually, I think, in just a moment here. Um, Dr. Kwan, is there anything about the gene transfer process that we have not covered that feels critical for people to know about. Since we, since many people listening to this will be particularly interested, as you pointed out, in gene transfer, we talked about that process, I think, quite comprehensively. But is there anything that we haven't touched on that feels important to you as someone no. who's intimately involved? No. So if you're interested, you should go to your provider, obviously, and see if you could participate in some of these trials. Um, but again, to participate, you'd have to go through an extensive screening and you have to be ready to, I don't know if the right word is it here, but listen to the doctor and follow their advice on what to do and what not to do while you're on that trial. Well, I think it here is, is a fair word. And look, we know that traditionally speaking, our community is not always the best at logging and I won't say adhering, but logging that the adherence has taken place. I think that is something that we collectively can be a little soft on, I'll say. So I think it's really important to underscore underscore the point you're making that people involved in clinical trials have quite a responsibility. It's not just it receiving and being involved in something as a passive patient. You have a very active role to play for quite some time. It truly is a contribution to science. I think that was something I didn't appreciate about no. clinical trials when I first heard about them. Right. And I thank all the patients that have participated, not just in the gene therapy, but all the clinical trials, because they have gone through all of this screening and participation and doing the logs and things like mm -hmm. that, that we've asked them to do. And these new therapies just wouldn't be available without them. So that's a big thank you to all those that did participate in any clinical trial. Is there anything about the process of being involved with investigational clinical trials? And again, not necessarily specific to gene therapy and that research, but just clinical trials writ large that through your career has really surprised you or kind of stuck out to you as an unexpected um, result of your being involved in a clinical trial? I've actually been really impressed with the patients that, you know, something goes wrong and we have to ask them to come back because we're scared that this number isn't right. And they're also willing to come back and get stuck again for blood. <laughs> That's just, I'm amazed by the community here and their willingness to do it. Well, I think that's a two-way street. And I think as somebody who's often willing to give a bit more blood, having doctors with such, a, it sounds cliche, but such a big heart and who give so much of who they are and their humanity to this science and this community, I know for me, it's always encouraged me to want to participate to whatever degree I can because I feel like so many people... You have. We've gotten you and, and you've sat for hours doing our, our uh, questionnaires. And I learn. I always yes. learn. I always wind up staying way longer, too, because I'm the one asking a lot of questions and picking uh, people's brains. But we actually have questions from other people to get to. So Perfect. I want to say thank you for this. This was really um, and I, I learned through this process, which I hope means other people have as well. HemeDifferently.com if you want to review anything that was brought up today or get a little bit more information. Um, but let's take a peek here at maybe some of the questions we have gotten in. I see a few right here on my th thread, Philly Greg. Am I okay to go ahead and read out some of these questions? Or are you going to read them to me? I'll read them out. I would love you to read them out. All right, so, right, so Ma Margie, Margie Bellhorn, Bellhorn asks, the vector that is used can only take smaller genes. Is there research identifying a vector that can take larger genes? So the current adeno-associated virus takes almost, I believe, I'm sorry to be technical, about five 
um, kilobases, and that's about the the size of the factor eight gene. Yes, the answer to the question is yes. Other quote viral vectors are being looked at. But for the AAV, but, there's... But, but for hemophilia, it's the AAV. And that has a ceiling on size, so to speak. That does. And, but there are other, and there are what we call lentiviruses that are being investigated and that they can actually hold bigger pieces of DNA, so to speak. So if it's a bigger gene, it can be fit into one of those viruses. I see. Okay, that's helpful. What else we got? So for this one, because there's an echo in here, oh. you might be able to hear me a little bit through Patrick's mic. Oh, how exciting. the question. Uh, but Ray DeToli asks, if AAV has no virus or only the shell, then uh, then what is my immune system going after? Chicken pox is a virus. AAV is just the shell? Great question. So if I'm understanding it, and to recap it, if, if what we're using is only the shell from the adeno-associated virus, what would an immune response, what would these antibodies be responding to if there's no the actual shell. virus there? The they are responding to the shell. They are responding. The shell is an out, outer coating, and the the antibodies in your body, that you're sorry, the antibodies that your body makes is actually against usually the viral shells. Oh, not even the virus itself, but its shell. It can actually, if the DNA um, is around and it sees it, then sometimes it'll make antibodies against it, but it's usually the viral shell that contains the proteins that stimulate that antibody. That's so, like the body's so amazing because here we are, we've, we've, this is the armor, right? This is the yes. shell. This is the thing to protect. So what does the immune system go after? The armor. It doesn't yes. go after the virus, at least not in well, every that's case. The, the part of a virus is its shell. So it's still part of the same inherent yes. properties, so to speak. Right. Man, the body's an amazing thing, though, that it's able to target like where the flaw is and go right. after that, which so, generally like we're thankful for. Right. So we're not infusing a virus, right? We're infusing the shell of that virus with your DNA. But the immune system well, not can your still... DNA, but the DNA that we're trying to fix. But the immune system can still respond to yes. it. That makes that makes sense. That's a great question from, from Ray. Uh, what else? Again, it'd be great if you could repeat this question after I say it. Sure. Um, Will gene therapy be investigated in younger patients? Ooh, that's an important one. I hear this. This comes up a lot. Will gene therapy be investigated in younger patients? Is there research being done that is pertaining to pediatric patients? Yes. So that is a topic of great discussion amongst uh, investigators that go in uh, that are interested in gene therapy. Again, we want to make sure that gene therapy is safe. Mm -hmm. And usually we do that and we start in adults. And how many years will it be before we consider it safe? That's yet to be determined. But before we treat children with it, we, again, want to make sure that it is safe. And then if it's shown to be safe, then it will be considered and they will start looking at younger ages. So right now it starts off at 18 and above. Um, maybe in a couple years, if it's shown to be safe, they'll go into younger people, maybe 16 or and above. And then if that's safe, maybe they'll go younger into 12. So we, we are still waiting for this safety issue first. And I think that's the most important thing. So yes, there is great interest because I think that the children can be um, some of the best candidates for this, right? They might benefit the most from it. But the other part of it is because we're targeting the liver, we want to make sure that because the liver grows, yeah. right? As oh, the I hadn't child thought about grows. That. And we might want something that's almost adult sized before we give it to them. So that's another consideration and things that get discussed when we go to these meetings, these long meetings. Well, if we get to go to any more, the coronavirus is canceling them all over the uh, place. Yes. We're going to be doing a lot more podcasts, I think, is what's going to yes. happen. The meetings are going to get replaced by podcasts. You're absolutely correct on that. So There's just some ready. guidance about you know travel and what's essential and non-essential at this point. Whole other bucket. So we're just going to yes. move right out of that one. Um, but, you know, there's two super interesting things, though, in what you just said. I think I'm used to products or, or uh, clinical trial. FDA approves things for adults before adults and children, everyone, quite often from what I've observed. Yes. And not just speaking about hemophilia. This is in general and out of an abundance of caution and based on safety. But what I had not thought about that is specific to the research into gene therapy is that element of 
a an organ in a child is still growing. Like mm-hmm. we haven't with uh, factor replacement products, we haven't had to consider yeah, you that just before. Dose it higher or lower because your size. Yeah, but now there's a whole <laughs> organ that we yes. have to take into consideration. So that's that's a big deal. Yes. Um, Greg, what else we got on the thread? Got two more. Uh, Will gene therapy be, be available for females diagnosed with heme A or heme B? Great question. So will gene therapy, is it being researched for females that have either hemophilia A or B? Is there any investigational clinical trial looking into that? There isn't any specific clinical trial looking into it that I am aware of. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> but at some point, it, there might be. It has been discussed again. What have you seen as some of the advances we've made for women with bleeding disorders and hemophilia in in general? Because that's a big, this is kind of a question that's part of a larger question. Right. So I think that there's a lot uh, of movement. um, And one of the biggest ones is even recognizing that women, many of them are carriers and I they have one gene, but the other one is not functioning as well. And they're what we call symptomatic carriers, but truly, if you're, you have a factor level of 20%, 30%, you still have mild hemophilia. And I think that's being recognized as causing bleeding. And it's not just women that are carriers, but even other women with true bleeding disorders. And there's the rare woman that actually has um, two X chromosome, which we didn't talk specifically, but it is X linked. Right. And you may have actually two hemophilia genes. And you could be severe. And yes, I, I think that you might qualify for some therapy, any clinical trial even. Yeah. And, it, you know, it reminds me of our conversation earlier, and I'm going to butcher the term, but monogenic. Yes. Right. So we start with a monogenic condition or, or disease state because it's simpler, just yes. frankly. Right. We're dealing yeah. with one gene, one protein. There we go. Yeah. As we learn, we can get more complicated. Kind of feels like the same principle is true here. We're yeah. starting with adult men with hemophilia, and as we learn more, things can expand from there. But yes. safety is over is it not overemphasized. It's emphasized so much that it makes sense that we would start a little more narrow, and then as we yes. learn, we expand. Yes. Um, all right. I think we had one question left. Philly Greg, take us home. Last one. Will this presentation be recorded so that we could view at a later date? What a great question. The answer to that. I'm repeat one more time. Oh, yeah. Thanks for that reminder. Uh, this presentation is being recorded. It will be available here on the Bloodstream Media page after today's live stream as a video. So if you found this helpful, if you want to share it with other people, please direct them to the Bloodstream Media page where they can watch this video and hear from our, I'm going to say our resident expert, because you are here in Southern California. So that's resident. Our resident expert, Dr. Kwan. Um, this was a lot of fun, and I, for me, this helped humanize what can sometimes feel really far away, and it helps it feel digestible and like something I can comprehend. So my hope is that we were able to do at least a little bit of that yeah. for the people who are watching it and will watch it hereafter, and perhaps down the road we'll have to have you back to uh, do a follow-up. Sounds great to me. Be happy to come back. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to Byron Marin for making this possible. Reminder that everything that we spoke about today is connected to the Heme Differently presentation and all of that um, information and the educational resources connected to it can be found at hemedifferently.com. Also, a reminder that no gene therapies for hemophilia have been determined to be safe or effective or approved by the FDA. For more on gene therapy research and Biomarin's content, as I said, visit hemedifferently.com. And if you want more information as it becomes available, sign up to receive it in your email inbox. And on behalf of everybody here at Bloodstream Media, thanks for tuning in to today's Bloodstream Live. Take care. Take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody. Thank you. We did it.